Good afternoon, I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer, here at the Law and Crime Report. We begin today by first saying Happy Veterans Day or Remembrance Day to those who served. Thank you for your service. Let's jump right into the stories we've got so far. We start off with Dominic Black. Like, you might not know his name, but he is the friend of Kyle Rittenhouse. He was accused now of providing the gun to Kyle Rittenhouse that was used in the shooting deaths of two individuals and the injuring of a third during those Kenosha, Wisconsin riots. Now, if you recall, Kyle Rittenhouse was too young to possess that gun, yet alone purchase it himself. Prosecutors are saying that Black purchased that gun with the intent and knowledge of passing it on to Kyle Rittenhouse to protect himself. They know this based on the statements that, that Black gave to the sheriffs that arrested him. Let's bring in our guest. I've got Mike Corbonics as well as Dr. John Delator. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, let's start off by looking at Daniel Miskins. He's a Kenosha, Wisconsin chief of police who gave us some more information about the case. So the last night, a 17-year-old individual from Antioch, Illinois, was involved in the use of firearms to reserve, to excuse me, to, uh, to resolve whatever conflict was in place. The result of it was two people are dead. This is not a police action. This is not the action, I believe, of those who set out to do protests. It is, involved, it is the persons who were involved after the legal time, involved in illegal activity that brought violence to this community. All right, so Mike, let's bring you in on this one first. This seems like an uphill battle for the defense because the way I'm reading the laws, it's almost like a strict liability. So long as I intentionally give, sell, donate, it's a pretty broad brush here, you a gun. If you in turn are under the age of 18 and take that gun and kill someone, that second part is almost strict liability. We're dead in the waters. It's six years of jail time. What are you making of this case so far for Dominic Black? It's a very difficult case, and it's always a difficult case when it's a strict liability type of statute because there's really not much for the defense to do other than hope that the jury sees it in some other way. Uh, but there, it's, it's very difficult. You would argue probably that, listen, I bought him a gun. I didn't know he was 18. I didn't know what he intended to do with it. That's all well and good, but... I don't know about the admissibility, if a judge would allow that defense to come forth based upon the way the statute's written. But I think from a defense point of view, the best arguments you may have at this statute is attacking, is attacking it on constitutional basis. And I'm not so much saying about the Second Amendment, but basically maybe they can go at this statute saying, as you mentioned, that it's vague and overbroad and it's really not specific. And we always know that in drafting criminal statutes to meet the constitutional expectations of them, the statute has to be drafted in such a way that people are put on notice for very specific crimes, not to give very broad discretion in prosecution. Yeah, so maybe the constitutional argument is here because the facts don't seem to fit. Doctor, we as defense attorneys have this little dirty secret of what's called jury nullification, where you might be guilty on the books, but if you've got the right story, you've got the right client, maybe you can lean into that in the community and say, hey, yeah, sure, he did it, but is this the type of person we want to convict? And I bring that up because there is such a polarization of Kyle Rittenhouse in the media now. Some people looking at, at, at him as a, as a vigilante doing well, like, like Batman, for example, or other people looking at him as a murderer. If you're Dominic Black and you've got that dichotomy, I think maybe the best way of leaning into this, and I'm sorry to use the pun, is like say, hey, if, if Kyle Rittenhouse is that vigilante, if he's that Batman going out there and protecting a community, uh, as they're saying, then isn't Dominic Black the Alfred to his Batman simply providing him with the ability to do good in the community, as he said? I don't know if that passes the laugh test, but do you think something like that could help him in a case such as this? I think so, and I think some of it's going to have to rely on the uh, voir dire process, asking uh, the potential jurors specific questions on how they view vigilantism, how they view the selling of one weapon, uh, a private sale of one weapon uh, from one person to another. There are ways in which you can construct a jury so that that kind of story will work well for them. Yeah. I mean, Mike, the doctor brings up great points. 
People have very polarized feelings about straw man purchases for, for guns, and this is, in a sense, a kind of straw man purchase. Uh, if I'm allowed to buy a gun and give it to a 19-year-old, why can't I buy a gun and give it to an 18-year-old? I mean, that 18-year-old can go serve our country uh, and, and fight and bleed and, and sweat and die for this country. And if the argument here is that Kyle Rittenhouse is doing the same thing, but domestically, do you see a maybe jury nullification argument that might float here? I think there may be, but your selection of the jury would have to be almost perfect um, because regardless of what happens in the trial, we only can predict what juries will will decide at the end of the day. And we don't know what happens during the organic flow of testimony and things of that nature. We know that strict liability statutes have been upheld in, in many different situations. It's the same thing with, you know, you have to be 21 to get a drink. The law clearly states the age. Uh, people cannot legally drink under the age of 21. Yeah, well, we'll see, because again, as a defense attorney, you just need one. We'll see what that plan is as this case develops and we'll continue to follow it. Let's switch gears and look at a case out of Oklahoma where a state senator by the name of Ike Lee Freeman is being prosecuted for first degree manslaughter. The story is, is that she was speeding and driving recklessly, according to police reports, down, down uh, Turner Turnpike. They clocked her at doing 91 in a 75 mile per hour zone. Now what occurred is that her vehicle crashed into an individual by the name of Enrique Lopez, who was in a disabled vehicle himself because prior to that, his car skidded off the road and into a ditch where he was stuck. Now let's bring our guests back in here. Doctor, this is one of those cases where there really is no winner. This is not an individual who is intentionally going out to kill someone. They were, as the police are saying, reckless and, and driving at an excessive speed. I know people are going to probably say, hey, 15, 16 miles over is, is speeding, but a lot of people do that, uh, not in probably these conditions, but it resulted in something horrific. You hear this story, and, and what comes to mind for you? Yeah, I think the key here is that the conditions of the environment, ultimately what they're going to say is that she should have known better. Just anyone who's behind the wheel of a car knows that they cannot be going at that speed in the rain on slick roads. I mean, it's a, it's a series of very unfortunate events, and I, it's, it's, it's a very tragic story, but I think the key here is that it was raining. She shouldn't have been driving that fast in the rain. And I think that's what they're going to try to hit her on. Yeah. Now, Mike, two-part question. First, is this a trial case or do you see this pleading out? And whether or not you, if it does plead out, if you think it's a trial, if this does go to trial, do you see an argument here? Or Because I'm not really seeing one. Yeah, I do. I do, Brian. I see an argument. I see this trial as being basically <clears throat> a battle of the experts. And when I say experts, I say um, I, I, I refer to accident reconstructionists, uh, people who will say, based on the facts, this is what their opinion is of how the accident was caused. The interesting thing here is that you have a proximate cause sort of argument here, and I think this is going to take a long time to develop, and the investigation has to go much further, is what was the driver who unfortunately was killed, what caused his accident? Maybe there was a defect in the road. She hit the same defect in the road that he did. And that's what put them both, ironically, in the exact same position where their cars wound up. I find that to be a very interesting point. And I think that the defense should really be trying to find the best expert they can at accident reconstruction. I'd be very curious to see what the state's theory is of how the car who suffered and was a victim of this how they were put in that same incident and what caused their accident. That's where I think this case lies. Now, Mike, I know you and I, as, as good friends, uh, kind of have this joke that you're the top count killer. You're going for that uh, top count of first degree manslaughter. And I can see that argument working here. But do you think, and just quickly before we go to break, do you think that you could beat the top count of first degree manslaughter, but reckless driving, reckless endangerment, those lesser included charges. Do you think the defense might get tripped up on that and the prosecution might have a winning argument for lesser included charges? I think these are very difficult cases to prosecute because I doubt there are going to be any jurors who are sitting in that box who haven't either been in an accident or know someone who is involved in an unfortunate accident and doesn't will not really see an accident as rising to a criminal sort of sanctioning. 
And I think that's going to be a bigger, I think it's going to be a tough case for the prosecution. Yeah, I like that. Not all accidents are crimes, and maybe that is the situation here. Could be a good argument for the defense. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more as we talk about Britney Spears, Brandon Willie Martin, and other stories here on the Long Crime Report. Welcome back. Let's dive into the story that many people are tweeting, Free Britney. It seems like the story of between Britney Spears and her father is toxic and is building in this conservatorship battle. Now, the last step in this battle that we've seen so far sees Britney Spears asking that her father step down from a conservatorship and implement a, an impartial third party to step in. However, her father, James Spears, is saying, I took this um, business that Britney Spears had from that was almost in debt, destitute, and I brought it back to the place where it is profitable. I'm doing a good job. Will allow me to stay. But the question becomes, as many people who are tweeting and saying, "Free Britney, free Britney," why does she need this conservatorship? It seems that she's doing these shows. She's out there. We're seeing her in the media, and it doesn't seem that she needs the legal requirements that come from a conservatorship that we're seeing in this case. Let's bring in our guest, starting with Mike Corbonics. Mike, I know you've been uh, a big fan of Britney singing Hit Me Baby one more time, and oops, I did it again. But now we're seeing that Britney is saying she might not perform again if her father remains a conservatorship. What are you making of this case and the development so far? Well, I'm not really understanding why the court wouldn't be inclined to appoint another conservator um, for her for her financials if if she has that much of an objection to it it's it's sort of showing that she is still needing some sort of help with her finances and things of that nature I mean just because she's appearing we don't have the um, in public doesn't mean that once she's out of the spotlight everything is honky dory that's more of my age group as opposed to oops I did it again but that everything's going real well. And I think this is a very sensitive, fact-sensitive, and expert-driven case of who should be the person in charge. But if she has an objection to it, the person and not the conservatorship, it shouldn't really be a difficult thing to work out for the court. Exactly. And, and part of that difficulty, Doctor, I'm going I'm to bring to you, um, we don't know all the facts because James Spears, her father, has always said, we want privacy in these proceedings uh, just to protect Britney Spears herself. But Britney Spears is kind of talking to that free Britney movement and saying, well, I want the media, not the media, but the public to see what's going on so they can understand what I'm going through and why I'm asking for my father to step down in his position. But doctor, I want you to weigh in on this one because this one is, is, is having a lot of questions for a lot of us. Uh, Britney Spears attorney, Samuel D. Ingram, on Tuesday called her a high functioning conservative. In my mind, I'm saying, bring her to Dr. Delatory let him examine her, and then the doctor can come on law and crime and tell us whether or not the conservatorship should be done. Um, is it as simple as that? And what do you make of this statement of high-functioning conservative? Um, so, yes, I do think it is as simple as her being brought to uh, an evaluator to, to, to figure out where she is currently in her mental status. So in order for someone to have the conservatorship, the person must be gravely disabled and have a serious mental illness. So essentially having the serious mental illness like schizophrenia, like depression, like bipolar disorder, like all of these other serious mental illnesses essentially leaves the person unable to care for themselves, which means then that they need a conservator, someone to assist in their day-to-day -day living and their finances and everything like that. However, if someone is even providing the food and the medications, then that person is no longer considered gravely disabled. And the idea that someone can be a high functioning goes completely against the idea of gravely disabled, one of the criteria that you need in order to have a conservator. So I can see where uh, the public is asking for a free Britney issue. But then I can also see where Brittany is talking about how, well, I still need this kind of help, though I'm not sure if she's able to think her way out of these kinds of complicated issues, that she actually does need a conservator. And perhaps she just needs someone on her team to help her manage her life a little bit better 
but not necessarily in a legal setting. Yeah. Now, doctor, here's a question for you, because this, I think, is the, and, and Mike hit the nail on the head. Because these proceedings are private, we don't know, have all the facts, but we're able to see Britney Spears perform in the media, walking around, and she appears to be functioning like any other person. But because, as Mike said, we don't get the behind the scenes, we don't get the medical examinations, do you think it's fair for us to look and say, okay, we can see some of it and we don't see all of it, so we can have a decision one way or another, whether it's free Britney or keep her in the conservatorship? Do you think we have enough information to make that uh, opinion uh, so far? Doctor. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, I do. So. Uh, what I would say is that the mental illness impacts the person's ability to function in their day-to-day -day life. That's what that's the idea of the gravely disabled. So if she's eating well, if she doesn't look like she's starving, if she's able to go on stage and perform and she remembers all of her, her lyrics, these are all pieces of evidence that go against the idea of being gravely disabled. All right, we'll see how that works out. Let's switch gears and talk about the mother of Dylan Redwine, who is saying she feels hopeless at the sight of this mistrial in this case. Now, if you don't remember, Dylan Redwine was killed by his father. Now, the prosecution is arguing that this happened because Dylan, the 13-year-old victim in this case, saw pictures of his father in compromising photos. Now, when I first heard this story, I was like, okay, so is he sleeping with a babysitter or the neighbor or, or, or who is it? But family members have said they've seen these photos and it depicts his father wearing a woman's outfit in a diaper and kept, get this, eating feces. And so as you hear the story, okay, it kind of starts to put together the pieces that the prosecution would have argued but for this mistrial. Now, why was the mistrial happened? Because the judge said he potentially had COVID, tested negative, and now the defense is saying they have to quarantine for it as well. Mike Korobonics, we are both practicing defense attorneys in this new world that is COVID-19. What do you make of the defense's argument that they have to postpone this trial and quarantine because of the fear that COVID-19 might have uh, penetrated this case? I, I have no problem with that. I think it's, listen, when the judge had it or thought he had it, there was no problem in him going and, and doing what he uh, did in a quarantine. Defense counsel, I, Every attorney who's walking into a courtroom these days, regardless of what anybody says or whatever position you have, is not very comfortable. It's not very comfortable. It's a very difficult situation. And when you're having an outbreak, I, I don't even see why there's a question or why this is an issue, because we don't know a lot about COVID right now. We don't know exactly how it's spreading. We've seen that it spreads in these kind of settings. We could do our best, but if our best isn't good enough, we have to back off. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to minimize it, doctor. I, I, I truly feel for this mother. For five years, there was no indictment of the man who killed her child. And I, I get it. You wait five years, some of us say, okay, wait another week, wait another two. But those weeks coming up to a trial where you're seeking justice for, your, for anyone, yet alone your 13-year-old child, can you kind of talk to us about, because you, you've seen these kind of cases, you've seen these kind of trials, you might have testified in some of these as well, uh, on behalf of the prosecutor and seeing these families sometimes look to even you, doctor, to say, doctor, can you help us in your expertise, give guidance to, to help either defense or prosecution? Can you talk to us about victims who are waiting day after day for cases like this? It's excruciating. I mean, one day can feel like a, a full year for as they wait for, for justice to be served. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's easy to say that we'll just delay this one week or two weeks and then we'll get back going. But in, in, in the mother's mind, that's her child. And this is someone who hasn't received justice yet. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, uh, how much this is very traumatizing for her to see that this thing is just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And she's not really going to see an end to it. There's going to be no real closure for her. Now, Mike, I, I often ask you not to put this hat back on, uh, but for just a moment, put your former prosecutor hat back on. In, my, in your mind, a mistrial happens in a case like this. You're the lead prosecutor in the case. What do you feel the, the prosecutor's role is, not only to the mother, 
to go and make sure that that hopelessness is dispelled, absolutely. But also to this case, is it immediately say, hey, we're gonna retrial this case in two weeks or, or three weeks or whatever? What do you think the role of the prosecutor is here? Well, the role of the prosecutor, and when I had the prosecutor hat on, I had hair underneath that hat back then, but the role of the prosecutor is to make sure the conviction can stand. We're in uncharted waters here with this COVID situation with jury trials and things of that nature. I mean, if, if he gets convicted and they reverse it in the appellate division, if one of his arguments says, listen, I don't think my counsel was effective because they were concerned about the COVID virus. They asked to have the case put off so they're quarantined. I think they were distracted. To be a prosecutor, you have to know more than the law. You have to deal with victims. You have to explain things to them so they understand the way the system works. And you have to say, listen, this may be a delay, but it's better than going through the whole trial and then having to go through it again if we get a conviction and there's appellate issues that arose in these uncharted waters. It's not an easy position to be in for either side or any defendant. It's new territory. Yeah, I mean, to that point, doctor, you, you, you touched on how a day could feel like a week or even longer than that. I think about this and I'm thinking to myself, especially because I've been in courts in this setting, I would rather for all parties, <laughs> prosecution, defense, uh, jurors, uh, victims in, this, in the family, I'd rather wait two weeks than to say you do the trial and then you say, you know what, there's an appeal that can last years. Do you think this could be a wiser move, as Mike is saying, and you kind of wait the two weeks to avoid any potential appeals? Absolutely. And it depends on how the person is uh, coping right now. If the victim is currently using more rational thinking, then obviously, you know, the way that, that Mike talked about it will we'll appease the rational mind and say, well, yeah, I'd rather that person be in prison than have than get out on some appeal issue. But sometimes the emotion of it can get in the way and the emotion of it can say, I want it now, not later. Yeah. Now, at this point in time, the trial has not begun. A jury has not been selected. So this can all start back up in a week or two, depending on when the defense comes back and says, hey, we've quarantined or whatever it may be. I think the judge should really push forward and say, hey, you want to quarantine? Great. You can quarantine for two weeks. You can read up on this case. If anything needs to happen, conferences or whatnot, we'll do it during Zoom. But in two weeks, one way or another, defense, prosecution, you're ready. Let's get this case going because someone needs justice here, whether you're thinking of the defense or the prosecution, and justice delayed is, of course, justice denied. We're gonna take a quick break and come back with more here at the Law and Crime Report as we talk about Brandon Willie Martin and the penalty phase after he's convicted for a triple homicide. Welcome back. Let's continue with the report. As we move over to California, where the murder of three individuals, a father, an uncle, and an ADT technician, were, were found a conviction in Brandon Willie Martin. Now, Brandon Willie Martin is a former professional baseball player who the defense is saying had mental illnesses that caused this horrific and horrific triple homicide. As the penalty phase is beginning, because the guilt phase is done, he was convicted, he's found guilty, the defense is putting forward witnesses to show that he should not be pulled to death. Let's start with the defendant's brother, Sean Martin. Did your brother also earn a scholarship to college? Yes, he did, but didn't go that route. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I knew my brother was doing good in sports, but I didn't know to what extent. Um, I always figured he would get a scholarship. It didn't recollect me that he wouldn't. And so I wasn't surprised. And at one point, the place that he was going to go to was my alma mater, where I was at the same time as Oregon State. So he had an offer to play there? Yes. Did you want him to come there? 100%. Why? Um, well, growing up in that sports environment, going through the daily just trials of being up at 6 a.m., not being able to do anything until 9 p.m., full schedule, that stress builds on you. And when you put stress, you put somebody that is not familiar with a lot of money in a situation, in my opinion, it leads to an unknown that I wasn't comfortable with. 
And so you're, you, you're speaking about your brother signing a pro contract. Yes. And sort of, was it your, did you want him to go to college instead of sign the pro contract? Yes. For the reasons that you just said? Yes. But uh, you knew that he did that. He signed the contract. Right? Yes. Um, was that a proud moment for your family? Yeah, probably one of the proudest moments of my life. Yeah. Of your life? Well, tell us about that. Um, well, the, the draft day was sometime in the spring. And so we had spring ball. Um, I was in Oregon with my roommate, uh, Jordan Poyer. He's the uh, safety for the Bills right now. Uh, him and me at Love Baseball. Uh, we were watching the, the draft, and uh, he got picked, and I just I couldn't believe it. And I just I started crying tears of joy, called him, told him how proud I was of him. All right, so Mike, again, already found guilty. The main question here for the jury, death penalty? or probably life in prison or some sort of mental health facility. What do you think the driving motivation or the driving force here is for the defense attorney in trying to get a positive result out of the jury? Well, I think what he's doing is what every good defense attorney does in these kind of cases with the death penalty is mitigate. When I say mitigate is humanize the defendant, show his flaws, show what his life was like. We were just talking a little while ago about how different things are, doing things video and things of that nature and Zoom and trials going on that way. When you're in a trial live like that, and I don't have to tell anybody on this panel because everybody here is in the courtroom, um, you can feel, you could feel the brother's pain. You could feel the concern they had. You could feel that this was a young man who really reached a breaking point and had a mental breakdown and it was, just horrible and horrific. Whether or not that is a cause to put someone to death, that's up to the jury. But what they're doing is saying, listen, this may not seem normal, but he hasn't had a normal life, nor was he equipped to handle the life that was dealt to him. I think that's where they're going. Yeah. Now, doctor, um, I can't imagine what this brother is going through. Uh, in, in one aspect, it, it's... If someone killed my father and uncle, I could see myself maybe not believing in the law of the land and maybe believing in a little bit more biblical laws. Um, but when that person who killed those people so close to you is also a relative, your brother, talk to us about like there's just a struggle internally that someone might have in coming to grips with, okay, I'm here to testify about the murder of someone so close to me by the person so close to me. How does that work out for that person? I think we have to look at what specifically uh, Sean Martin had said. And he said that he understood that if his brother signed this pro contract, it would lead to stress. I think instinctively he knew what his brother was struggling with, not only with the fame and money and, and, and all of the trappings of that, but also the rigors of the schedule that he had to go through and the intensity in which he had to perform in order to become a professional athlete. I think he knew what his brother was kind of struggling with. And I, it seems like the entire family loved one another because uh, he was able to come back and live with them after he lost the contract. And so I'm not surprised that uh, the brother is leaning a little bit more towards uh, redemption and be an acceptance and and just ex, uh, re recognizing that his brother made a very terrible terrible choice and I think his brother knew that something like being overly stressed out was going to lead to poor decision making by by yeah so Mike just from a nuts and bolts perspective good witness bad witness is this a right step forward for the defense in that stage. Excellent witness, because if a brother, like you pointed out, Brian, if a brother could forgive his brother for killing their parents, I mean, that's as close as I think you could get. I think a jury may, and I'm not a doctor, this is a better question for the doctor, but I think in the back of their mind, the jury's saying, wait, if his brother could forgive him, maybe we should and save his life. I mean, Mike, I'm never going to ask you to give me mouth to mouth, but you are at least a Juris doctorate. Give yourself some credit. Uh, let's <laughs> listen to a little bit more of the brother's testimony during this, the penalty phase. How does your brother look today?
Not good. Does he look different than in the picture that you're looking at? Yes. Does he look more similar to the way you saw him at that Eagle Glen residence? Yeah. Yes. What's the difference? What's the change? Between this picture and then? Yeah. The, the happiness, the confidence, um, the competitiveness. Um, yeah. Those things, I think, are our major keystones to who we are as people. Um, me and my brother, growing up, very confident in ourselves, very competitive. And I think that's what drove us to be successful in sports. And so seeing that gone from him was just like, it was just a blow, huge blow. You said you were on your toes the whole time, as were your parents. Uh, why were you so on edge or on your toes? The unknown. To be honest with you, the unknown. Um, you're dealing with somebody that at that point was very unstable, very not knowing what you're going to do next to where I didn't feel safe and I didn't feel safe for my parents either or my brother uh, for his health, for his safety. Is that a conversation that you had with your parents during that time? Multiple times. And what was their reaction to that? Um, it was very skewed. Um, I would have conversations. I would ask that he be kicked out. I would ask that they would not let him back in. Um, I would ask that they just really let him be on his own and just figure it out himself. But my parents being the type of people they are, they didn't want that. They, they saw what happens to people driving by on the street, homeless people begging for money. And my mom, she would see those people in my brother and she didn't want that for him. And so they would keep him there and that was their responsibility. They, they took it on full fledged and they were saying, if anything happens, this is our situation. We're gonna handle it. And if worse comes to worse, this is us. Like we're, we're gonna handle it. And so it, it frustrated me 100% because me, I'm, I'm very black and white. I'm very blunt. And when I see something's wrong, I don't sugarcoat it. I rip the bandaid off and I say, this is the issue. Please fix it or we're gonna have a problem. I told them that. Um, I got very angry at my parents. Um, a couple times maybe I disrespected them when I shouldn't have. Um, it was just very angry because I was seeing somebody that had so much potential in life just throw it down the drain. And it, it was very sad to watch. So doctor, I want, I want to hit you with this one first. Throughout the trial, from beginning all the way to where we are now, there has been an undertone that is almost like they're talking about a civil case and a criminal case at the same time where they are squarely putting a lot of the blame on the system, on the institution that released him after 48 hours rather than 72 hours based on a 5150, on the fact that he should have gotten countless mental health evaluations and, and aid when they received that aid. Talk to us about what you perceive may or may not have been the failures in terms of the mental institutions that he was in and the lack or maybe you think there's adequate support that he received. You know, I, I think the defendant has really had a very hard time with having the access to the appropriate uh, medical and mental health uh, system. I think what was going on was that uh, he, he should have been held for the full 72 hours, perhaps even longer, especially if he was already uh, if he was already put there because he was making statements and threatened harm to his family. There was no way that he should have been let go and released until he was fully stabilized on medications. There should have been wraparound services, someone that probably could have drove with him home, talked to him more. Perhaps he should have checked in on an individual uh, intensive outpatient program. There are other things that I think probably would have led to this event not occurring that for some reason just did not happen for him. Yeah. Now, Mike, I know this happens in many states, and, and I'm surprised that, it, that more non-lawyers don't know it. But if someone is found guilty, uh, or sorry, not guilty, by reason of insanity or mental disease or defect, I know at least in New York, and please tell me if it happens in New Jersey, it doesn't mean they just get to go walk the streets. Oftentimes, they serve the similar or same amount of time that they would have in jail inside of a mental health institution getting the rehabilitation that they would not have gotten otherwise. Do you see this as maybe being a uh, potential here in this case? 
if the defense can win this mental health argument? Yeah, I, I think it's a very, very good argument. And yes, we do have it in New Jersey. And in New Jersey, sometimes, frankly, the people wind up, if they're found guilty by insanity, serving more time because we have what we call crawl hearings here where the, where the court will constantly reevaluate the status and the progress of the mental status of that defendant, and they'll do it every few years on a review or whatever needed. For people with a, with a mental issue, I think this is a much better approach for some sort of rehabilitation and making sure that person is safe to others and themselves. Yeah. Now, Dr. I mean, softball question here, pardon the pun, but I'm assuming that from what you're seeing, it would be better for Brandon Martin to be maybe in an, in an institution rather than a jail. Could a prison or a jail only make whatever mental health issues he have has worse than they are now rather than actually solving them or making them absolutely. better? Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think he will be better served in a mental health institution rather than prison. I think prison settings don't blend towards rehabilitation, even if there are rehab programs contained within them. Um, this is this is a person who definitely leads ongoing wraparound mental health services that a prison setting will not offer. He will get medications, but the therapeutic, uh, interventions, therapy, counseling, things like that, probably not going to be helpful. And the medications that he's prescribed may not be the ones that he absolutely needs. So he needs a mental institution rather than prison. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll show you a psychiatrist who took the stand saying that Brandon William Martin was at high risk. We'll dive into that after this. All right, and we're back discussing the Brandon Willie Martin case where a psychiatrist took the stand and described Martin as a high-risk individual and told us what that meant. Let's take a look. What did Brandon relate to you that day? He came with mother. He said, I'm okay. Uh, mother put the condition that her son will get treatment for anger outbursts. He was eliminated from the baseball camp in March because he got into a fight and fractured a finger so he couldn't play. Under, uh, under the phrase uh, severity, once again, in the upper right-hand corner, you said high, correct? Yes. So that hadn't changed since, since the last visit? Correct? Yes. Uh, under risk level, you also said high, correct? Yes. And what does that mean, risk level? risk that he can deteriorate further and become dangerous for himself or others. Okay. Um, under the diagnosis, under comment, you put unstable. Do you see that? Comment diagnosis? Yes. What did, what did you mean when you wrote unstable? He was under no treatment. His behavior was uh, violent, uh, proven by uh, the episode he had uh, in the campus where actually he was terminated. And yeah, the anger outbursts were still there. Okay. And then you last saw Brandon on December 20th of 2014. Is that correct? Correct. And what did Brandon tell you that day? Uh, you and my mother are trying to dope me up so I will not play baseball again. I don't need to be here. So he's basically accusing you and his mom of trying to medicate him so he can't play baseball again. Is that correct? Correct. That, that phrase that you wrote there, is that fall in line with your diagnosis of paranoia and schizophrenia? Yes, he was clearly paranoid even against me that I'm trying to hurt him. Doctor, I know it's a little unfair. You only saw a small snippet of, of what the psychiatrist is saying there. But first, can you make heads and tails of, of what she's saying? And then can you kind of continue the line of thinking as to what she's saying about Mr. Martin? So I think here's one of the other issues when it comes to problematic services that he's received. If I were to see these notes, I'm not sure that I would have a clear understanding of what this psychiatrist was really 
looking at and really seeing. I mean, when she testifies, then it kind of makes sense. But how is someone else supposed to treat this guy if the diagnosis that she writes is unstable? That that's not an accurate diagnosis. I mean, yes, his risk level is high, but he's also been, you know, engaging in violent acts with uh, teammates and his family members and things like that. So this is someone who, even when his own private services, doesn't appear to be receiving that the services that he needs in order to stabilize. She's not talking about what medications that she placed him on. She's not talking about uh, what resiliency factors and what strengths base that he can actually rely on. What have they been working on on his coping skills? He seems to be deteriorating, but there's no clear reason as to what exactly is going on. So just because someone is complaining that they're using, that someone's prescribing them drugs doesn't necessarily make it a delusion. It's probably true that he's not able to compete at a high level because of the drugs that he's taking. But what makes it a delusion? Is he saying that they're purposefully dosing him with things and that's the problem? Because then he should be in a higher level of care, not continuing to see an outpatient psychiatrist. Doctor, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, it, it appears like you're saying no one really took the time to sit down and properly evaluate him. It seems like they only kind of took this on a surface level and didn't dive deeper. You're talking about almost being like, okay, he says this, but what does that mean? And how does that interplay with the coping mechanism? This Does it seem like they just kind of glossed over uh, Brandon Martin in terms of the services that could have helped him and maybe saved his family and this ADT worker's life? Based on the testimony that she's given, where he's the, the attorneys ask, well, what's this diagnosis? Well, she writes unstable. Uh, you have the risk level high, but then has to explain it during her testimony. There are a lot of things that if I was to receive the, the, the treatment notes from this psychiatrist, I wouldn't actually know what has happened. What sort of treatment has actually gone through? Now, again, I haven't seen these notes. Maybe there's more detail in another area that explains further. But the testimony that she's given, it doesn't sound like uh, she's gone deep into understanding what exactly is, is going on. Is this related to substances that he's using? Or is this an actual mental illness? Because that changes the prescriptions that she would have to make. So it doesn't seem like there was a lot of in-depth discovery in evaluating this person, just taking everything at face value without truly doing a, a solid psychological evaluation. All right, Mike, I hit a triple. I'm on third base, you're up next to bat. The doctor just gave a lot of good facts for the defense attorney in terms of how they might be able to show that there was an absolute systematic failure when it came to Brandon and Willie Martin, and that there's a potential that although they might not have all the information, that he suffered from mental illnesses that affected his ability here. How are you gonna bring this case home based on what the doctor just said? Well, I think what you want to do is make sure that your expert shows, the defense expert shows, that there was clear disease, mental health disease that was, was being suffered. And not only that, it was clear, I think it's always important that the expert, whether it be a, a, a physical doctor or a mental health doctor, has some sort of continuity of meeting with the defendant. Not someone who looks like a hired gun who looked over some papers and said, OK, this is my opinion because I've qualified as an expert before. I think to really hit home with the jury, they have to see some connection between the defendant and the expert who has met him on more than one or two occasions. So you're going to need someone to probably. So, but how do you do that, though, Mike? Because especially in these day and ages with the covid, you're saying you're going to need someone to evaluate him or at least see him on multiple occasions over a period of time. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, the, 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 yes, absolutely. And that starts from the time of arrest. A lot of people, you know, the, the last stage of any defense is the courtroom. You have to start preparing that case from the moment your client is under arrest, and you have to start preparing for the worst. That means, you know, it, it's always, sometimes you tell a client, I want to prepare. I'm not saying you're guilty. I'm not saying anything, but I want to prepare should they be able to prove their case? I want to know you. 
I want to know the things I could argue perhaps to either get you a better resolution to your case without a trial or have that judge understand who you are. And I need to understand that from day one, exactly. not after I found out all about the case. You got to build a case like you build a home from the foundation up, not from the top down. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. That's the end of our show today. Back to the regular schedule program. We'll see you next time. Yeah.